Good evening, Uganda, and welcome to the show on the spot. My name is Patrick Kamara, and tonight let me begin by reading just um, a quote from the, a press release that is coming from uh, State House. It says, The government of Uganda has decided to enhance its involvement in ensuring the security of the supply of petroleum products into the country by mandating the Uganda National Oil Company Limited, UNOC, to source and supply the petroleum products to the licensed oil marketing companies actively involved in the importation of the products for Uganda. And I continue to say this has necessitated the amendment of the Petroleum Supply Act 2003 through the Petroleum Supply Amendment Bill 2023, which was presented and approved by the Cabinet on Monday. We're talking about October 23rd, 2023. And now, this is the guest of our discussion tonight, and my guest is a legal and corporate affairs head at UNOC, Mr. Peter Molisa. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Peter. It's a pleasure. Good evening to you, and good evening to our viewers. So now, the whole idea about importation of fuel or oil into Uganda is trying to source from the source, getting oil or fuel or diesel, petroleum or whatever it is, from the exporters in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in Iran and wherever it is. This is a fundamental change from, what, from how business has been dealt with. This is not what you have done before. This is not your known competence. I even wonder whether it is even your interest. <laughs> Tell us about the change. Oh, great. Now, thank you, Patrick, and good evening to our viewers once again. Uh, so maybe the, the back of the history will help to, to, to set the stage about what we are doing. So previously, we've sourced petroleum products, of course, uh, through Kenya. Yes. And uh, Kenya, the Republic of Kenya would run ten, a tender system uh, that only involved Kenyan oil marketing companies. And so there were two layers of players in Kenya uh, before you get to the international player, the one who brings the petroleum products to, 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 to Mombasa. And there was a similar structure in Tanzania. And so our customers, they would do bid, run their tenders, bring the product, and our, our oil marketing companies would buy from Kenyan oil marketing companies. So there were two layers of middlemen in there. And this has been the system for a very long time. But uh, once in a while, if anything disrupted the market in Kenya, it would affect us directly and immediately. But as a landlocked country, we have an international law right to access the sea directly. And so we realized that to solve this problem that causes security of supply risk to the country, that affects prices, that causes fluctuation in supplies, uh, we needed to go directly and be able to source products and we receive them in Mombasa or in Dar es Salaam. And they come directly to Uganda. Uh, they are Ugandan destined product. No one can touch them, no one can divert them, they are ours. But wait a minute, you are changing mm -hmm. a system that has been working for Uganda mm -hmm. for as long as Uganda has been a nation. Mm -hmm. What has changed over the last few months for you to say, listen now, now maybe bypass the so-called middlemen uh -huh. and go and do the business ourselves? So basically the, 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 the key thing that changed is uh, we initially, we had what uh, was called the open tender system, in which uh, a tender would run every month. And at the end of the day, the entity that wins that tender imports and sells to Kenya oil marketing companies. And then our companies would buy from oil, uh, from oil marketing so companies So it was in Kenya, Kenya that is, is giving out the tender, right? Yes. So Kenya was managing that tender. But of course, nobody is in this business for charity. So every time you have uh, a player, there is an additional margin. And so what we've done is remove these two oil marketing companies, players in Kenya, so that that margin is removed. Because once you remove that margin, then you're able to influence the efficiency of But when the you say remove into these Uganda, oil marketing companies in Kenya, mm -hmm. this is a Kenyan sovereign state that is removing oil com marketing companies in Kenya. That's not a Ugandan business, is it? That's not for you. No, so may maybe I can explain it. Uh, so what used to happen is that uh, Ugandan oil marketing companies that would say this year, let me give an example, let me use Total, because they are our partners. Uh, if Total requires 5 million liters this month, 
it would nominate that amount of volume with a Kenyan total subsidiary or a Kenyan registered total or even any other entity. And that would put that nomination into the Kenyan tender system. Now another company or even total would bid to win the tender for that month. Remember now the Ugandan volume is put together, the Kenyan volume is put together, somebody would tender for the entire volume. Now, whoever wins, whether it's one company or five companies, would then give Total Kenya its volume, including the one for Uganda, and then Total Uganda would pick from Total Kenya its volumes. So you can see that for Total Kenya, Uganda, to access the products, it has to go through two layers of entities that are registered in Kenya. So these are like the middlemen. Exactly. And in that so, case, mm, uh, you'd find the pump price would go up because everybody's putting in their kind of... Definitely, everyone in that, la in that lane has a margin. So what we've done in this new structure, in this new policy structure, is remove the Kenyan middlemen, the Kenyan players, the, these, those two that I'm talking about, and in there put UNOC, the Uganda National Union. But UNOC, and then you is are an organization to, that is young, yes. you have your teething problems, you are taking <laughs> baby steps, and yet you want to take on an issue that is extremely difficult to undertake. Uh, do you know what you're talking so about? Let me first say it's not difficult. It's, it's buying products, transporting them, and providing them to the market. And what we have done as Uganda, national, done as Uganda National Company, uh, from 2019, we, we, we looked at this business, structured it, came up with a business plan. And from 2020 March, as lockdown was starting, we started importing. We've done more than 30 uh, transactions delivering to Ugandan oil marketing companies. And so we've been able to do this business and we've been scaling up from 1 million liters to 2 million liters, we've been scaling up. And you might note that uh, during the last Kenyan election, we did not have disruptions in the market. We imported 8 million liters and we are managing them. So it's a business that we have been testing, we have been doing, and we have. Yes, but, but even, though, even though you are able to and import able 8 to million liters and you have done this 30 times, mm -hmm. the other companies have done them for 60 years or more. Of course, they also had and, their and, one. And yes, so, so they, have, they have the comparative, the competitive advantage, mm -hmm. they understand the business more, they understand the business terrain than you do, and there is a possibility that should any go wrong you could actually jolt the economy <laughs> that's true that's true but this is what we've done so you will know that we are in the upstream sector of the of petroleum uh, petroleum uh, business and how do we do it we work with partners okay so we bring our experience of however few the years that we have had and we work with partners so through partnerships we're able to leverage on experience financial muscle and we build based on our strategic uh, footing. Wait a minute. So now what we're talking we about bringing right the now. partner, yes. that partner could actually, you're actually substituting one middleman with to another. No, not at all. So what do you mean by a partner? So what Why can't you done? buy? What if you have, have the done? capacity, you have the experience, you have done you have done the dry run, you've been buying from the source, why do you need a partner? <laughs> uh, so, uh, Patrick, what we have done is we have done the dry run. Yes. We've, we've understood the business. We have brought expertise in-house to get the business done. But even at that level, you need to have partners that have been in the business for a while, that have the capacity to make things work. And so what we have done, that uh, the international player, the one who brings the petroleum products to us at the seaboard, is an international player, one of the top five in the world. And so that's the partnership, that we have our own experience, we have built our capacity, we are a strategic partner in the country, and so then we, we work with I, the I can imagine Ugandans watching, Ugandans watching and are interested in petroleum uh, business uh, mm -hmm. thinking, now the devil is in the partner. Why? Who is this partner? Why this partner? Very how, how did he so come in this partner? Uh -huh. Why, uh, did you single source? <laughs> Okay, so let me just break it down for mm -hmm. people to understand. So what, what UNOC has done is that we have entered, we have entered a, an agreement with a very significant international player uh, called VITOL. If you rank top five in the world of uh, 
petroleum products trading, you'll find Vito is there. And what Vito is going to do? Vito has refineries, Vito has the capacity to distribute all over the world, and it does distribute all over the world. So our, our partnership is that we buy from them. We control how they transport these products. They get to us from the international market, and we source that product from them and sell. No, no, the okay. Whole I, I, of Uganda. I'm not. I don't want to 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 doubt the capacity of Vitor, mm -hmm. but I just want to question the mode of engagement between Unoc and, and Vitor because it looks like you just went what, with this single uh, organization or company to do business with because oh. for transparency, yes. would have maybe expected that there are many other players who are also bidding to partner with you, mm -hmm. and then you choose Vitor. Of course, Patrick, as a government, we did not walk into Vitor's office and say, here is a contract sign. We considered several entities. We did due diligence on them. We reviewed their capacities. We looked at their offers. What do you offer to us? What, is, what are your terms? And we came up with Vitor eventually and so whereas you you may not have been involved in that process that happens in the background but we do not walk into one company and say here is the contract and no, of course not there was a process that eventually resulted into Vito being our partner but the law that we have enacted allows the minister gives the minister powers if Vito does not deliver if you know fails to deliver because of some whatever or some reasons with logistic or otherwise the minister can nominate another international player but but Mr. Melissa do you understand that you don't have the luxury of saying maybe Vito may not do the job maybe they fail to deliver mm -hmm. this is an economy we are talking about any slight disruption in the supply chain of oil into Uganda the economy is down do you understand no, that? Do you appreciate that? We are aware. We are awake to that risk. And the reason we are coming in to do this is actually to deal with that risk, which is the security of supply. If you look at that bill and now that is an act, the thrust of that act was to deal with the security of supply. Why? Because in the past we've had situations where when there is a disruption in, in the petroleum products flow, the government of Kenya takes first supplies its local market and we are starved of, pe of petroleum. And so that would cause insecurity of supply. And this bill, this act has come in to actually cover that. And how does it cover that? Because we are dealing directly with the international market as Uganda national companies. And we have leeway in the law and in our contracting structure that if the international player does not deliver or we see that is about to fail to deliver, we have options. Uh, but those options are not through three layers of middlemen or two layers of middlemen. It's direct in the international market. We are playing in the international market. So the options are there. The, but security, you must work the security of supply, first and foremost, for Uganda to be in a better position, mm -hmm. you must have your own oil reserves. St storage capacity mm -hmm. that can maybe take you for some months. Mm -hmm. There is none. Almost. But that's that's one option. Yeah, but but how can a country mm -hmm. and you know run a country and you know oil is like the, the current that the currency that moves around the nation. You do not have you know the oil res reserves to protect yourselves in case of a problem. I mean, you have a point in terms of petroleum reserves, but the most important thing, even as as a nation that is landlocked. The most important thing is your logistic system working. Um, it's not just a small point. No, no, it's, because it, that it, issue it's is actually in the point. new bill. It's in the bill, right? <laughs> of having reserves. <laughs> it was in the Act. It, the and now it's in the Act. law. No, the 2003 Act had provision for reserves. We have 30 million liters uh, reserves in ginger. We are in the process of constructing 320 million liters reserves in MPG. We have to. We have plans to do other reserves. But in you see, and but you see, you were so tinkering with the system could, you, you could let on the see. premise that you're going even to build reserves. Why didn't you at least build reserves, and then you can play around in case there's a shock? You have a fallback position. So, uh, Patrick, let's let's just circle back and focus on facts. Okay. Uh, the system that has been our source of supplying, getting petroleum products, has had its own shocks, has had its own challenges. You were here in 2007. You saw the challenges. The post-election violence in yes. Kenya. I bought fuel a litre at 10,000 in 2007. 
we have had situations where fuel destined for Uganda is diverted. So the system itself has had its challenges, but it has worked. Now what the system we are putting in place is to improve it. But that system is a logistic system. So what we are working on is to ensure that that logistic system is efficient. However, in addition to the logistical system that allows petroleum products to continue to flow into Uganda, we have a terminal in Jinja. This new process allows us to continuously feed it so that we have certain... But you see, uh, Mr. Melissa, with all Jinja. respect, mm -hmm. you have replaced the Kenyan middleman with your Vito middleman. No. Bec that's what the so partnership the, the, the is all about. Kenya, Kenya because it's Vito that was going to be buying from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, to bring to UNOC. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Patrick, if we can go back and I explain it again. So there are two layers of middlemen, of oil marketing companies registered in Kenya, okay, before you get to the international player. These two are the ones we have removed and put UNOC. Yeah. So the international player... So, uh, so isn't that what I'm saying? You have replaced one middleman with another. So if, you, if it is replacing the two oil marketing companies in Kenya with UNOC, that I accept. But is it better? With UNOC or with Vitor? Uh, Patrick, if you could just listen to, to my explanation. Okay. So in Kenya, if, if, if UNOC has a registered, I, I think I used Total, let me use Total as an example. Total wants to buy products and bring them to Uganda. It will say I need 2 million liters of petroleum products and it will tell Total registered in Kenya to nominate for it. That entity will nominate into the Kenyan system. Somebody in Kenya will bid, and maybe the supplier on the other side will be a refinery, will be Vito, will be Glenco, will be any other company on the other side. So that person will receive, give total of Kenya, total of Kenya will give total of Uganda. So these are two. So are those the are the two tires that are, are. So UNOC is coming to replace these two to directly deal with the other international supplier. In our case, that international supplier is Vito. Okay? okay, so we are dealing directly. Now, there are two things that you're not sitting in the in the in this space as a government entity. You are able to regulate the manner of margin that you get as a national oil company. UNOC is not a wholly dependent on this business. We have other businesses. We're in upstream, we're in the midstream. And so our margin is reasonable. And because it is reasonable, it is going to eventually have an impact on the price. I know you have done your due diligence. Yes. And I know uh, they tell, uh, of course, they are also making money. Mm -hmm. And you, you are going to have a contract with them. And, and if they breach it, then that's illegal and you can take them to court. Mm -hmm. But you should also understand mm -hmm. that you are dealing in a strategic resource. It is. It is a national security issue. It definitely and that anybody, mm -hmm. anybody who wants to harm Uganda mm -hmm. can pass through an organization or a company dealing with business. Yes. And just one single move, you are on your knees. Now, of course, uh, the, you, are, every, you appreciate that. In every contract, uh, let's see, what is a contract? A contract is a distribution, an allocation of risks and obligations. And so what we do with the, the Attorney General's office and everybody involved, and what we do in all these contracts is that we look at all these risks and find mitigation measures that are sustainable, that are sufficient. And I can assure you that the kind of structuring we've put in place, including the law itself, the kind of structuring we've put in our, in our, in our agreements, in our structuring, is such that all these risks, security of supply, uh, pricing risk, all, good, all the risks that we can talk about, we have created mitigation measures to ensure that we protect the eventual uh, recipient of these products at the pump. But more importantly, ensure that the flow into the country of these products is continuous. Okay, uh, so there have been organizations in Kenya, business entities that have been involved in this business. Mm -hmm. You're taking them out, that means their livelihood is almost gone, is at risk. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's potential for sabotage. Uh, not really. Uh, I, I, I would Peter, do, there's mm -hmm. potential for sabotage. Mm -hmm. Have you put a um, contingency plan just in case? Well, I, I do not think that that is going to happen, largely because uh, the, the Ugandan component of the import of the product is not the biggest that they've been dealing with. The Kenyan market is much, much bigger than ours. And these players have been playing in the Kenyan market, in the Ugandan market. But we've also been using uh, the Tanzanian route. So it is unlikely that anybody would have the need, the justification, or the muscle 
to sabotage a, a state interest. What I actually think is going to happen is that they are going to restructure their business in relation to Ugandan products and trade with us in a different manner. So I do not expect that it's going to be sabotage. The government of Kenya has committed and has provided support in ensuring that uh, we execute this uh, project. Uh, we have had conversations with the government of Tanzania. It is supportive and uh, we believe that we should be able to execute and have the first products uh, delivered, have the first ship delivered uh, in Feb this coming year. So this is in, in, in entirely a joint operation between Uganda and Kenya? Absolutely. We've had uh, conversations at the highest level with the government of Kenya at the technical level, at the ministerial level, and every one of them is supporting us because they understand what we're doing. They understand why we're doing it. And they know that as a sovereign state, we have a right to do that. And based on our relationship, our long working relationship in this industry and in others, they are absolutely supportive. So in this case, it is actually not UNOC. Mm that will be buying um, fuel products directly from the exporter in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's Vitor that will be buying on your behalf. Not really. So let's first unpack this animal called Vitor. Okay. So Vitor, if you go to, to, to Dubai, to Fujaira, you'll find big storage terminals, you'll find refineries that are owned by Vitor. If you go to India, if you go to other places, you'll find it has facilities. You go to Rotterdam, you go to all these places, they have facilities. So Vito is an international petroleum products trader, one of the biggest in the whole world, probably among the top five. And so when you're dealing with them, you're dealing with a refiner, you're dealing with a trader, you're, you're dealing with the primary supplier of the products. You're not dealing with somebody who is going to buy from another and sell to you. You're dealing with a big entity okay. that has a refining capacity that is basically a primary you're supplier. You're more or less buying from them. Exactly. Not more or less, we are buying. We are from buying them. from them. Yes. So, okay. So now, what is the Ugandan consumer likely to see happen come February next year in terms of pump price? Because at the end of the day, mm. we are interested in the pump price. It's killing us, Peter. Absolutely. And that's the reason we are taking this decision. We are taking this decision to ensure that the final client at the pump benefits from efficiencies. And with efficiencies, there is definitely an impact on the price at some point. And why are we saying this? Because you look at the components of what, uh, uh, what were the components of the price at the pump. Mm -hmm. You look at the international price, the price of that product on the day as traded all over the world, uh, plus tra transport and insurance to Mombasa. Now, if you have inefficiencies between Mombasa and Uganda, the price keeps increasing. Now, we are removing those inefficiencies and saying, UNOC receives from the international supplier and brings the product to everybody in Uganda at the same price. Now, once you remove those inefficiencies, there is definitely going to be an impact on the price. And that is the target. Our target is to ensure that the product flows. We do not have any chance of disruptions. We do not have any chance of our product being diverted. We do not have any chance of our product not coming to us because we are getting it from the international market destined stamped Ugandan product and once it gets here these efficiencies and the fact that as you know we are now in the international market we negotiate better because we are out there there is a real chance that our products will be cheaper in the region and that's but our target one of the things that make maybe our product expensive mm -hmm. is the logistical nightmare you have to go through to make sure you have gotten oil from Mombasa to here. How do you, uh, normally how do you evacuate it to Kampala? Uh -huh. So basically uh, what has been happening is that uh, product is um, uh, put into uh, Kenya pipeline company facilities and those pipelines discharge. Which you pay for. Yes, yes, it's, it's a transportation. Yeah. It's like you would get a truck and it ships you, it brings your product. Uh, but the price there is known, it's understood, and it's a reasonable cost for the, for the, for the service. So then it comes to Kisumu or Eldoret. It is Eldoret. pumped from Mombasa to Kisumu? Yes, okay. pumped uh, in the pipeline to Kisumu or Eldoret. And from Eldoret, or we, we truck it. We, we get trucks and they bring it to Uganda. From Kisumu, it is trucked, but it can also be transported over the lake. And we have been able to transport about 24 million liters over the lake so that system is already tested you see you see you see that that, that is where 
I don't know why. You have a natural advantage over mm. there that you can just put a lot of cargo in a barge yes. from a Kisumu yes. to Luzira or Port Bell or wherever you want it. Mm. But you're still having using trucks on the road. So that makes uh, fuel expensive, but also mm -hmm. that destroys our roads. But also, that's not even smart business. No, to be honest. In 2023, why you're only trying now mm -hmm. to, under, to sort of to see how you can use Lake Victoria? Yeah. Yet that should be the norm. That should have been the norm like yesterday. One good, wonders why. You make a very good point, uh, but uh, each each idea has a, a point of conception and it has a point of execution and it starts. So in 2021, we did think through this. And so we had uh, contracts with the Kenya rail system and the Ugandan one. And we had three badges that uh, were available that could carry cargo into Uganda. And so we tested the route and we used it several times. So we've been able to bring about 24 million liters without incident. What is the percentage of what uh, you brought? Oh. in terms of what comes on the road and it's coming on Lake Victoria? No, of course, 24 uh, million liters is uh, close to 10% of our, of our monthly cost. So 90% is still, still coming through the road? On the road, yes. But why, are we doing, why, why is it in that? Why is it that we haven't fully utilized Lake Victoria? There are two things. Uh, one, when we would get the, the, the barge in uh, Ginger, we would uh, pull it off, uh, the, we would pull the wagons off the, off the barge and rail them into our terminal in Jinja and then discharge the product and get the tanks back in, onto the lake. It's not very efficient in terms of speed, in loading, offloading and, and other, other things. So what we have done on our side is we realize that we need to build a, ja a barge. Uh, so that you bring uh, 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 about 2 million liters at once and you discharge in the shortest time possible. So we've done studies to see how we can do, um, uh, <coughs> we can do a pipeline that connects our terminals to the lake and then the ships can come and discharge. And we now know the, the cost of, of, of doing this and part <coughs> of our deal mm -hmm. in this new structure is to have that pipeline constructed to the lake and barges can come and offload from the lake the, uh, faster to the ginger facility. To the ginger facility, and and that's in in our deal. <coughs> this new structure, mm -hmm. constructing that 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 pipeline to the lake is one of the things we're going to do. Of course, we've had another facility built in 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 in, um, in Entebbe mm -hmm. that has now that pipeline and we can be used to quickly discharge the product. That is going to be considered as well. We are looking at Portibale as another discharge point. So all these are being considered. But Patrick, to be able to do this, you need to have, first of all, control the volumes. Because this business requires volumes. If you're bringing 2 million liters, you cannot construct a pipeline and a jetty. It would not be justified. But now, the fact that UNOC is bringing all the products, we can build that pipeline and jetty and commercially justify it. And we're going to build it. Peter and Melissa, hold on to your point because you're going to take a break mm -hmm. and on the spot we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On the Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Peter Melissa from UNOC and we're talking about UNOC's sole importation of petroleum products. You know, I understand there are court cases in Kenya mm -hmm. regarding this development. So what is being done? On this issue and, and, and Kenya a sovereign state all this is not even in your hands doesn't that concern you I mean uh, <clears throat> I'm a lawyer by training and um, I spent my first 11 years of practice of my profession before courts so when somebody sues from where I sit it's a normal thing it's a right that everybody has and a company like UNOC, when we get into the business arena, it's expected that at some point somebody will have uh, an, is an issue with what we're doing and they'll file a suit. So, but what I don't, the impression I don't want to give is that it's a sovereign state against another sovereign state. No. No, it's, it's UNOC and some entity, actually, the government of Kenya, together with UNOC, have been sued by uh, some, some entities, a few entities and one individual and they filed a, a suit, uh, which is a normal thing in a democratic structure in a commercial arena. Uh, so the government of Kenya has put in its defense, we have put in uh, our defense, we will be in court next week, 
Uh, from where I sit as a lawyer, it's not a complicated matter. It's not a matter that we should not win uh, and uh, co conclude and f f finish with our business. So we're not really worried about it. Uh, we, we believe that um, it is an exercise of a businessman's right to seek court's redress. And we, shall res we have responded and we are going to... Yeah, you, know, you know, as a lawyer, of course, you also know that in some, you win some cases and you lose others. Yeah, absolutely. So even this, and you can never know that you're going to win or lose until the verdict is given. Uh, in many ways you can. And you, you don't know how this one is going to go. In many it could ways actually go can. south, Peter. No, either way, even if, even if we lost it, we'll still do the business. Uh, but the, the idea is that we are going to win it and we'll have to, 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 to finalize that, that bit. But it has not stopped our business. We have to continue doing this business. Let, let me just give you a bit of uh, uh, the, the basis for my confidence uh, in this case. Uh, under international law, the, every state that is landlocked has an international law right to access the sea. And it uses facilities of that state that has uh, its border with the sea uh, to access the sea. And that state must facilitate the landlocked state to access the sea. So we do not see anybody uh, challenging or denying us that right, which is what we're exercising right now. So people will file suits, but how do you beat something like that, a right like that? So we believe that that suit will be definitely concluded uh, in the manner that we think it should be concluded, and we should be able to continue. Right now we are continuing. The good thing as, as, as Uganda, you have been able to take on even bigger cases in the UK and, 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 and even win them. Maybe that's where, that, but it's part of the basis of your confidence. <laughs> uh, but are there some requirements that you need to comply with in Kenya? Mm -hmm. Has you not know, been able to, you know, to comply? Yes, of course, we are, we are going through Kenya. We are going to use the facilities of Kenya Pipeline Company. Uh, so we shall pump the products from Mombasa to Kisumu to Eldoret. And so we must enter an agreement with the Kenya Pipeline Company uh, that regulate how the rates we shall pay, how regularly we pump, or how much space we shall have. So that is under negotiation. That's, that's, that's one of the tasks that we are handling. The other elements of uh, the kind of business you're running, the kind of entity you need to register, then getting an office for our staff to sit there and ensure that they manage the, the logistics. These are small, small issues that we are handling. But uh, the schedule, which is uh, Feb, Feb, Feb next year to have our first uh, vessel, has put all this into consideration. And we have people working on this day uh, and night, literally, uh, to make sure that we are ready and we supply the market. We are landlocked or maybe landlinked, mm -hmm. uh, but we are not the only ones. I'm sure even oil destined for Eastern Congo, for Rwanda, Burundi, and whatever South Sudan has also been going through Uganda. Yes. Well, those are also sovereign states, but you have an idea mm -hmm. how they're going to be dealing with their own. Of course, they've, they've been dealing, they've been getting their products the way we've been getting our products, through the Kenyan tender system and through the Tanzanian tender system. Uh, 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 if I, I could speak for Eastern DRC and, and South Sudan, that, that they've been using that system. So, I mean, they will, will probably continue with that system or they will join us or they will start their own system. It's their sovereign states, they can absolutely do what they want. Uh, so, but for now, we think that they will continue with what they've been doing until they probably maybe decide decided to, to adjust. So what we are doing affects us as, as Uganda. It is focused on the products that come to Uganda. If uh, it, it, DRC feels uh, it is more efficient to join us, that's perfect. If South Sudan feels the same, great. We'll be able to, to look at how we can work out that. Can you be absolutely sure that what you're intending to do will eventually uh, bring the prices down at the pump. So let, let me just do the math for you. Just, just simple math. So let me say we have uh, somebody who brings products to Mombasa. He says to somebody who is in Kenya. Who says to another person who is in Kenya. That other person is the one who says to the Ugandan. You're going through like two more steps. Uh, to yes. Now these two, each of them, it's a business. They are charging something. Even if it is two dollars per metric ton, it is an additional cost. Now what we are doing is, as you know, because we are removing these two and dealing directly with the entity that would be So is it also possible that those Kenyan oil marketing companies at one point, perhaps they were even buying from Vito? 
Absolutely. I mean, Vito has supplied, has, has had some tenders in which it has participated, both in Kenya and in Tanzania. So Vito is not new to the market. Uh, and um, there, there are other suppliers, we, we could list them. But uh, they, they've all been dealing with Kenyan uh, oil marketing companies. You Tanzania know why, why Ugandans same. become very jittery when mm -hmm. we hear of, uh, you know, organizations? Because at one point, mm -hmm. you would hear we're dealing with an entity, mm -hmm. And then that end it turns out is actually not even there. <laughs> I remember in the, in the construction of the Katosi Road, yes. there was an entity somewhere in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. But the same people went to, to see the thing was a briefcase, send you a brief company that's not there. At one point, mm. you dealt and signed an agreement and signed a contract for somebody to build a refinery. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. I think it was a, a global something in Russia, mm -hmm. only to realize that the thing has no capacity. It was a neighbor. In fact, the refinery up now has never been built. But now you are dealing with the nerve system of the economy. Mm -hmm. And so we could find ourselves in a similar situation. And, 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 and Peter, I'm saying this because mm -hmm. many individuals also talk big about this organization that had been contracted to do business with Uganda, only to realize mm -hmm. that actually they don't exist and have no capacity. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, there's there's there's, there's a veto, you know, of a Ugandan, there's a Ugandan veto. <laughs> there's a Ugandan veto. Uh, no, this I is hope there's no <coughs> Ugandan veto who we are dealing with at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. No, the, the reality is uh, this country uh, has a deficit of integrity. I believe if you went to UK and Googled, you'll find uh, somebody who did something that was uh, below standard or not in line with integrity. And so every nation has its own stories. And uh, some stories are fantastic, other stories are not. And as a country, we've had a share of the ugly and the good. But uh, let me say what we've done in oil and gas and what we have mastered in oil and gas and the example that we have set in the sector as oil and gas is doing things right and doing things through very, 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 very serious, uh, rigorous due diligence and ensuring Open. the entities that we are dealing with are able to do. I mean, look at our upstream. You need an investment of $16 billion. You cannot have a briefcase company coming here and uh, it will fail on the first try because it's, you must put real money on the table. And so even this, because you're dealing with products, uh, Patrick, mm. in a month we consume uh, nearly 240 million liters of petroleum products. If you assume that each liter is a dollar, costs us a dollar, you need cash flow of to afford to supply $240 million worth of product, you need real cash flow. So this is not, it's, 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 the standard is so high that the briefcase companies cannot play. They have no room at, at, at all to play. And this is the idea. But of course, uh, uh, that standard alone is not enough. Knowing that our standard is so high, the money must be real, the capacity must be real. We go behind it and do, do due diligence. You know, when, when you do something like this, mm -hmm. um, to benefit Ugandans, for the better of Uganda, mm -hmm. you also know the pipelines are running through Kenya. Mm -hmm. The Kenyan businesses have been taken out, more or less like taken out of action. Mm -hmm. You know, there have been many cases in the world mm -hmm. of, of sabotaging the pipelines. It has happened in Nigeria before, and, and, and because we could be dealing with people who are angry, maybe they are losing a case in court, they have lost their livelihood of sorts, mm -hmm. and, and you're still pumping oil through their land. Mm -hmm. The possibility of sabotage scares me. No, not at all. And I'll tell you why. Uh, how much revenue do you think uh, Kenya Pipeline Company is going to receive from us? Colossal sums of money. Exactly. So they are as interested in the safe passage of that product as we are. Two, Kenya supplies its western side through those pipelines. It's western part of the country, Eldoret, Kisumu, Naivasha, all these areas through those pipelines. So in many ways, in many ways, we are s together. In this, in this project. I do not see anybody who would benefit other than, say, a terrorist. 
not a, no legitimate businessman, no legitimate citizen of any country would puncture a system like that that is bringing so much revenue to his or her government. So I don't see that happening because Kenya Pipeline Company laid pipes. It's a business venture. Mm -hmm. And it says, come rent my space. And we are coming to them as you know to rent that space to transport our products. We pay for that space. They are absolutely uh, going to support to protect that product because it is their obligation, their duty. Once we pay to deliver that product to Eldoret or Kisumu, and uh, at the governmental level, we are working together. We are supporting each other. So I do not see any lapse in security, any motivation for anybody uh, to puncture that system that is mutually benefiting the two countries. You know, w w I understand we're supposed to have fast oil f flowing from our own oil wells by 2025, right? Yes. And one would wonder, if you have soldier on for the last 60 years using the same system, <laughs> well, it has given you a few things, mm -hmm. why again now Involve you change it so much, mm -hmm. yet literally months away, you'll be pumping oil, oil from Hoima. So what happens with this? No, it's, it's a good process, but let me tell you the other bit. Mm -hmm. that, uh, <coughs> when we pump, oh, you're not sure about the Hoima oil. No, no, no. We have not we, been sure for so many years. We wouldn't, we wouldn't invest twelve billion dollars if we weren't sure, Patrick. That's a lot of do you money know, do you know, to gamble. Do you know your, your targets? How they have been changing? Of course, I can explain every change. And yeah, I've explained yeah. it to you before. You can explain it more, <laughs> even 2025. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, as I speak today, mm. there are three rigs in the Telenga segment of the fields, drilling every day, drilling wells. We have a rig in Kingfisher, uh, the southern part of the lake, drilling since Feb, uh, uh, since Feb uh, last year. And we have the pipes to construct the pipeline to be laid in the ground. Today, we have, we, they have arrived in Dar es Salaam for the first 100 kilometers of the pipe. More are coming. And so we couldn't, we can't be in that, that, that level of investment when we're not sure about the crude oil. So what I can say again is that crude oil will be pumped out in 2025. That's when we shall have fast oil. But that will not give us the petroleum products that we desire on the pumps. So it will take maybe two years for our refinery to be commissioned. And that refinery will supply products directly to us. But imagine, Patrick, if the refinery starts pumping its products and we have been doing this business, bringing, supplying the whole country for two, three years, that refinery will find us as a company ready to now completely offtake its products and supply the market because we're already doing it. So that's why it is important that I'm not, at this point... I, I know I'm not in Enoch, but as a Ugandan, as a Ugandan mm -hmm. who has been watching the space, mm -hmm. I'm not optimistic about the refinery business. But we're going to get into that refinery issue <laughs> after the break. Because right now, Thank you. we're going to take a break and on the spot, we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Peter Mulisa, Head of Legal and Corporate Affairs at UNOC. And we're talking about Uganda's sole importation of crude of oil uh, or petroleum products uh, from the supp suppliers or exporters in the Middle East. But, but enough now talking about the oil in the Middle East. <laughs> we also have our own in Hoima and, and, and the Acholi sub-region. Uh -huh. Who knows, you could even anywhere else in Uganda because yes. you are yet even to explore many parts of yes. our country. Yes. I know for a fact that one of the reasons why we delayed for oil to get out of the ground was President Yuri Museveni was more preoccupied with not exporting crude. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I would want to imagine that he could be happy that uh, crude is being exported, is, is about to be exported. That that was not his original idea. Mm -hmm. His original idea seemed to have failed flat. <laughs> and that was to build the refinery first. Mm -hmm. And actually you even went ahead, I think more than five, six years ago, to look for somebody to build a refinery. Mm -hmm. You contacted some guys in, in South Korea, some guys in India, and you zeroed on a Russian company. RT Global. RT Global was actually having no capacity, it fell apart. Mm -hmm. What assurances can you give mm -hmm. that for really a refinery is going to be built in Hoima soon? Well, the, the, the assurances I can give is that uh, 
Uh, I work for the government and I have sat in this government for so many years. And I know that um, we have an agreement with uh, the joint venture partners, Total, Sinok and Unok, of course, uh, that when the crude is produced, the refinery will have a right of first call for 60,000 barrels. Then what remains is exported. And we have gone ahead to, to, to do front-end engineering design for the refinery, so we know the type of refinery, the capacity, the product slate of this refinery. We know how much it is likely to cost us to construct and run. And we have done environmental social impact assessment for the refinery. Uh, that is complete. We've done commercial studies, logistic studies. How will the products be sold? How will they be transported? So as a project, it is mature. We have acquired land for where the refinery is going to be. We have acquired land for where its pipelines will be that will transport the refined products. So the, as a project, it's ready. What remains is taking a final investment decision for the refinery. But let me just make, uh, let the public understand. For a refinery to work, it needs feedstock. Its feedstock is crude oil. Now when you get an investor uh, to come and build a refinery, but they are not part of the group of investors that is going to produce crude oil. They need some level of comfort that Assurance. The crude oil is actually going to be produced. Now, four or five years ago, we were still negotiating uh, commercial agreements. There was no drilling happening. There was no construction of pipelines happening. There was no activity, tangible activity, to get the crude oil out. So you can understand why an investor... So was this about ago, you in the oil sector doing things because you did not understand them well? No, With this explanation, all. one wonders, why would you even engage RT Global six, seven years ago? You know, but, uh, let, me, let me explain why we did that. Now, an investor then would have had a problem because he's not seeing production happening or activity to get the crude oil out. We are still negotiating yes, commercial yes. agreements. Now, so the investors we had conversations with asked these questions. And we told them, we are the government. We are involved in the production of crude oil. We are certain that crude oil is going to be produced. We are finalizing agreements. And we said, start on the studies. Front-end engineering and design, environmental social impact assessment, all these other studies that are needed. So that when the action of getting the crude oil starts, all these studies have been done, what we do is just construct the refinery. And we have been able to achieve that. So what remains now is to start the process, take the, the front end, rather take a final investment decision and start construction of the refinery. And I can assure you, because the refinery is extremely important to the state, first for the security of supply, for the petroleum products. Remember, we're talking about security of supply, relying on products that are coming from the Arabian Gulf, India, Singapore, and going through Kenya, 1,300 kilometers to reach us. But here we'd have a refinery, refining products within our borders and producing for our market and other markets. So that is the real security of supply, when you have refined products within your borders. And so, because of that particular reason, but also because of the industrialization agenda that spurs off the refinery, we need that refinery and we are committed as a government to getting that refinery done. And so I can assure you that as we work on the pipeline, as we work on the upstream to get the crude oil out, we are equally heavily engaged in getting the refinery constructed. You, you, you know, and, and one would want to know if that refinery will be able to actually get out the many multiple products that can come from from oil absolutely so what what we've structured is that uh, in the in the industrial park in hoima where the refinery is going to sit we have space for other industries petrochemical industries fertilizer industries all these other industries that will use uh, byproducts from the refinery to do to produce other products and that's why we're talking about uh, an oil industrialization agenda a petrochem based industrialization around the refinery and when we look at the macroeconomic impact of this industrial park and the refinery. It's something that as a nation we must and we will deliver. So, um, you know we've been there before mm -hmm. where you, actually we started even having the, I think he, timelines of 2012, 2014 and 2016 mm -hmm. and so when Ugandans are skeptical mm -hmm. about this oil thing mm -hmm. they have, you know, 
there's a reason for that. There's, there's a record to show. No, no, I'll, 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 I'll say this, that um, <clears throat> these are mega projects. Mega projects are like driving a trailer. You don't turn in the same space as a small car. Uh, you need space, you need time, you need, you need discussions. And sometimes what you think will take two months may take eight. What you think may take five will take a year. And so we are dealing with mega projects. So getting them from the point of concept to final investment decision, to implementation, to operation, is heavy, heavy lifting. And so we, we had all these years of heavy lifting, but what I can say is that the heavy lifting is over. The day we took final investment decision, the heavy lifting was over. We entered the zone now of science, engineering, uh, machines, uh, construction, and those ones have definite timelines. When you're constructing a, a project, uh, putting pipelines in the ground, you have a definite time because you can know how long it will take to cut the ground, to put the pipeline in, to cut the pipeline and put it in. So where we are at, we are in a space where timelines are nearly accurate because we are dealing with construction and, ext and, and uh, extraction. So when we say that based on the drilling campaign we are taking, the construction of the pipeline, the construction of the central processing facilities, all these facilities that we are constructing, 2025 as the year of production is possible, we are based on nearly, nearly actual numbers. So now, if you, somebody goes to the Albert and Graben where you are working right now, mm -hmm. what do I find? What kind oh. of activities do I find? Oh my God. You will find 13,000 people working. What? 13,000 people working. That's the biggest find, army of workers you can yes, ever find anywhere in Uganda. You'll find the biggest hotel in Uganda in Ibulisa, like 4,000 man camp. People are sleeping in that camp, working day and night. You'll find square kilometers of areas that we have opened to construct industrial parks. Activities in the southern part of the, of the lake, uh, in Ibulisa northern part of the lake, you'll find rigs drilling every day, drilling wells. So there is so much activity that is happening, and it's just not there. It is on the East African crude oil pipeline route, both in Uganda and in Tanzania. So paint for me a picture, and for those who are, are watching right now, when you talk about drilling wells, yeah. uh, the, you drill, you hit the whatever, and you do what? You seal it and leave it, yes. or you drill and pump out and store? Yeah. So basically, the wells that are being drilled now, uh, it is in two reservoirs that were discovered that are known to contain crude oil. But now we are drilling wells that will produce the, the, the producer wells, wells that will produce the crude oil, that will basically suck the crude oil out mm -hmm. to the ground to be put in pipelines and transported. Now, there are many wells that we are going to drill, more than 450. Uh, but some of them are wells that will inject water into the reservoir to maintain the pressure and increase production or maintain production. And so all these wells are being drilled at the same time. But what happens is that once the well is drilled, it is sunk, it gets into the reservoir, uh, so successfully is able to extract crude oil, it is sealed. At, at the top and more wells are drilled, sealed, uh, continued and they seal them. Now once we reach the point of uh, in the number of wells to, that can produce, that should be enough to produce the volumes that we want, then those will be linked together and enabled to produce. Simply put, unsealed mm -hmm. and enabled to produce and pr to get the fluids. Into I understand the some of those wells mm -hmm. are, that are being drilled are actually going to be drilled under Lake Kalabat. Yes. That's, is, that's an area that is ecologically sensitive. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, if you look at uh, how the, this technology works, and it works in the deep sea, it works on shallow lakes, it works in, sea, in, in lakes, uh, freshwater lakes. So it's tested all over the world. Uh, how it works is for Kingfisher, which is the one that will be drilling uh, under the lake, largely under the lake, is uh, the, the rig is on the ozone shore, is on land. And it is drilled, uh, then uh, directed uh, to the reservoir. They go down and then yes. go horizontal. Yes. And uh, if the lake, <coughs> I think the deepest part of the lake is about 650 meters. Uh, but this will go about three kilometers to seven kilometers under the lake. So it has absolutely no contact with even the. You know why I'm saying bed. that? Because mm -hmm. I saw a couple of years back 
the Macondo oil spill. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you followed that. Uh, definitely. Every the, oil and gas <laughs> practitioner. <laughs> the Macondo oil spill, mm -hmm. I think, in the Gulf of Mexico, yes. that caused a headache mm -hmm. to a technologically advanced America. Mm -hmm. You don't look at the U.S. as a state. You look at the players. Of course, there was the British Petroleum, which is one of the biggest in the sector. So basically, it is, a spill can happen. But in the history of oil and gas, the spills have been few and far between, largely because of our high standards in, in health and safety. And so what we've done is that you're drilling three kilometers, th seven kilometers under the lake. The, the, the fluids come straight uh, 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 to the land, absolutely no contact with the water and we have mechanism to ensure that uh, the fluid is safely uh, brought to, to land and so we do not believe that the, and after Macondo there's been advancement in the technology to ensure that uh, uh, an explosion like that a blowout would, does not happen or if it is because it's gas building in the system uh, that you're able to detect it way ahead of time and and manage it and so Macondo itself led to further innovation which we are now uh, uh, in we have an advantage to take, or we can take advantage of, and we are taking advantage of. If you go to our drilling sites, you will find those, those, uh, that technology in operation that detects buildup of gas to ensure that it is prevented. So we, don't, we have put high standards to ensure that uh, there is no chance for a blowout, there is no chance for a spill, and um, for even spills, even, even, even though you've put in all these technological solutions, you, we still have a contingency plan should there be a, a spill, which is highly unlikely. And so we are ready to ensure that the products are produced, the, the, the crude oil is produced safely, and we should be able to deliver it uh, safely. But you also know that, uh, for example, where we are, um, is the region is a a systemic kind of um, sensitive area yeah. prone to earthquakes mm -hmm. and you're having all these projects you're, you're drilling seven kilometers down mm -hmm. um, you know I hope that that is being taken care of with that in mind no. after every 30 years that region <coughs> normally gets I'm told mm -hmm. uh, a serious earthquake the last was in 1994 mm -hmm. perhaps in 2024 we could have another major one <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the elders have been saying yeah. that after every 30 years it happened yeah it happened 1964 1994 who knows <laughs> 2024 no, to, to be, to the, the reality is that all these studies are done the, the, the behavior of the rocks, the behavior of the te tectonic uh, structures, and all these studies are done, and the solutions that we use, the choice of technology, the choice of structures, the choice of um, uh, the, 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 the over the ground facilities, where they sit, in what manner they sit, is, it, it takes all these into consideration. And they studied these patterns way for so many years back, not okay. just 30, not 40, way, way back. And you'll notice that oil generally occurs in areas that are uh, sometimes te 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 tectonically active. And uh, so all these have been done before, they've been managed before, the studies have put all these into consideration. So we have studied the behavior and we have put in place responses and structures that should withstand anything of that nature happening. As we try to conclude our discussion tonight, mm -hmm. one would want to know about the progress of Hoima. Is it Kavalega International Airport or Hoima yes. International Airport? I don't know how they're going to call it. Yeah. But, but at what level are we? And oh. some of the things that are coming on the sea, one would imagine probably they will be landing in at Hoima International Airport. No, definitely, we believe that uh, most of the uh, of the <coughs> of the machinery for the refinery will be will be transported by air, and so that airport will work will be helpful for us. The airport is complete, literally ready to go, uh, and uh, I believe that the Ministry of Works had intended to launch it sometime this year. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is this month or next This month is done. Next month, this month of December. But it is ready. I, I hope it has a befitting a terminal ago. building. You know, I'm saying this because there's a time when I saw somebody was trying to build a, a stadium, or this in Kaunda grounds, what, and then they put for us. <laughs> I, I, I hope they <coughs> I we have the as yeah, Ugandans yes. to, to go for mediocrity. To do small things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. But the, the phase the phase one of this um, uh, airport 
port is really focused on cargo. And so the terminal that is there is to facilitate cargo. And uh, the, the terminal for passengers is really small. They are looking at uh, 50 passengers per day. Uh, but as now it turns into uh, an airport that supports tourism, that supports agriculture exportation, then the second phase of the airport why, will be constructed. Why, why would you build an airport, put a lot of money, and have the passenger terminal of the capacity of 50 passengers per day? I think it really depends on uh, what you're looking at, because the intention, the primary Then you're really talking about something very small. Then I'm, I'm actually my fear is, is being now. No, have you been to the airport? <laughs> no, I'm what you're take you what, what you're telling me now. It's, it's one of the so the, the the airport in terms of the runway and um, the, 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 the in terms of capacity what it can handle. It can handle four of the biggest the biggest cargo airplanes in the world at once. Four, those. Big Antonov that uh, carry uh, the heaviest uh, that can carry the, the he very heavy. I've uh, seen huge. I've seen yes. huge cargo planes so get if it out can of, handle uh, four of military them. military assets, yes. including tanks and what, exactly. get out of. So if it can handle those at the same time, four of them, it is really not small. The the runway is about three point five kilometers, uh, and it's it's perfect. It's a very good airport. But its initial business case is cargo. Cargo for and so it has provision for cargo requirements, but it is going to eventually develop into a commercial a, 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 a commercial uh, airport. And at that point, that's why the ministry has a phase two, which is to now build a bigger terminal for commercial uh, transportation passengers and the others. Of course, if they it do it today... It could also help Entebbe in case of anything. Absolutely. Then you know where absolutely. else you can plan. Because if you need to divert a plane <coughs> from Entebbe, now you have to either take it to Nairobi or Chigari or, I don't know, maybe Tisangana or Kinshasa or Kilimanjaro. But now we'll have this airport. But the other bit is also, if you have tourists, they don't have to first do three-hour tra road transport. They can fly into uh, into Hoima, do the northern parks, and then do the western parks, fly from there and go back to their countries. So eventually it will do that. If you want to export uh, goods from there to, say, Angola, Gabon, you can fly from there four hours to Egypt straight. So it will eventually be a logistics, but also a tourist commercial hub. All right. Yeah. Uh, as we conclude, I want to go back to our original issue, Top and that yes. is the sole importation of oil. So, yes. you said by February, yes. uh, you know, and Vito, you'll be handling this, uh, bringing in, um, uh, you know, importing in oil products. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have checked everything, you yes. you and most likely it will be seamless, right? No, we've done everything and we, it, it is going to be seamless. We have tested this route, we have tested the transportation, we have uh, uh, with the pipeline transportation on the side of Kenya. It is going to be efficient. Uh, the target, the, the, the reason the government has done this is to ensure that we, ha we are constantly supplied of products without any form of disruption that is external. Two, that we remove some middlemen that we think, uh, uh, the, we sh whose costs we think we should not bear as, as a nation. And put our national oil company to bring all the products so that all the importers in Uganda receive from UNOC. So the, the, only, port of, the only point of um, uh, monopoly is at the point of bringing the products into the country. And it is UNOC which is owned by the state. And so, but the, the other oil, oil marketing companies will continue to compete. Okay. Now we believe that this, you know, <coughs> this is going to deliver efficiency and at the end of the day, the customer should be able to have positive impact, to feel a positive impact. I know some Ugandan businessmen mm -hmm. and I feel for them tonight, mm -hmm. especially those who have been trying to get into the business of importing, you know, in bulk oil uh, products into Uganda using the badge. For example, Captain Mike Mukula mm -hmm. has been building something, it's a facility like that in Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, th this one, this isn't this a, a dead blow to his business? Yeah. Let's first look at his business model. So he was going to buy petroleum products from Kenyan oil marketing companies because you can't, the way the structure was, is he, he's in, unable to go past the Kenyan oil marketing companies and import directly. So he was going to buy from those two layers of oil marketing companies and transport here. See? So that means he can buy from us with our efficiencies, probably at a better price, and still run his business. So we have probably made his business easier.
Yeah, that's still yes. a probability. No, no, not, not it. We've made it easier. Because instead of buying from the other two layers of middlemen, he's buying directly from us. So we are, there is definitely an advantage. There is efficiency there. And so we are not affecting him because our monopoly is in bringing products up to the borders of Uganda. Inside Uganda, storage, transportation, selling at the retail pumps is still a competitive business. And those will continue running business like they were. Absolutely. Only that this time maybe they will buy at a lower price. Absolutely. So what we've done for him is make his access to the product even better. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Peter Melissa, what's going to be your concluding remark tonight? Now, to tell people to, be, uh, to support this project and to uh, work and continue running the businesses the way they've been running them and expect efficiencies in the, in the transportation and procurement of petroleum products into Uganda and hopefully we should be able to have better and more stable prices at the pump. Peter Molisa, Head of Legal and Corporate Affairs at UNOC, thank you so much for having honored the invitation. Thank you for having added value to our platform, mm -hmm. explaining some of these things. We are hopeful that Uganda can do this thing better. I know you're going through unfamiliar territory, but if you are prepared, because opportunities find come for the prepared mind. Yes. At this time around, I hope you are prepared, and if you are, that will be for the benefit of Uganda. And that yes. brings... And that the end of tonight's edition of On the Spot. Join us again to next week, same station, same time. Good night and God bless Uganda.